You're listening to audio from the Decidedly Podcast. For more information, find us on Instagram at Decidedly Podcast. Has there ever been something that you've spent money on that you realize later, maybe even after spending the money, that that thing, that expense was not really that important to you? Uh, there was a, there was a period, I spent a lot of money for a period of time on a lot of guns that I have not shot or used in a while. I had had a friend that he and I would go out and and shoot. Uh, he ended up passing away from cancer about probably six, seven years ago. And those guns never came out, have not come out of the gun safe since. And what I realized was what I was really valuing was my relationship with my friend was the time I would spend with him uh, together, the the community that we were building. We would invite other other guys out and, and shoot, you know, target practice. Uh, so it wasn't really the guns I was spending the money on. I was spending the money to kind of foster this relationship that was that was important to me. Oh, that's cool. I've definitely spent money on hobbies and interests that I found out weren't really my own interests before. Um, funny enough, mine was cars. I spent money on cars because I had a lot of friends that were car guys and I thought it was kind of a cool thing to have a cool truck. I don't drive a beater, but I don't drive a super nice, tricked out with all the toys, customized, pimp my ride car either. Right. And I'm comfortable not doing that because I know that I'm not a car guy and I don't get really into them. Our guest today has a lot of wisdom to share about aligning your money to your values and being Rich Without Losing Your Soul. That's the title of one of his books. Rabbi Steve Leader is joining the show. This is going to be one of your favorite episodes. It's one of my favorite episodes. I really, really enjoyed talking to Rabbi Leader today. He is a highly respected spiritual leader and author, currently, or most recently rather, serving as the senior rabbi of the Wilshire Boulevard Temple in Los Angeles His influence extends far beyond the synagogue, though. He's a regular contributor and guest on platforms like the Today Show and Time. His writings have appeared in Town and Country, the LA Times, USA Today. He's earned prestigious awards, including the Louis Rappaport Award for Excellence in Commentary from the American Jewish Press Association and the Cowler Award from the Religious Action Center in Washington, D.C. Newsweek magazine recognized him as one of the top 10 most influential rabbis in America. We talked about faith and business. We talked about aligning your money to your values. We talked about understanding the difference between right and wrong. This is um, one of the most rich episodes with nuggets of wisdom that you can carry through your business and your life. Enjoy our conversation with Rabbi Steve Leader. I'm Sanger Smith. As always, I'm with my dad, Sean Smith, and this is Decidedly. Yeah, you were, you were telling us that you know your your dad and your grand your dad and your uncle had this junkyard. So, but I'm interested how someone decides to move from growing up in a junkyard to becoming a a rabbi. Uh, take me through that journey. Um, well, I always knew that the junkyard wasn't for me, much to my father's disappointment. You know, in my junior year of college, I studied writing at Northwestern University. Always knew from 15 I wanted to be a rabbi, but my junior year of college, my dad said to me, you know, I think there are a couple of career paths you should consider. You could go to law school and take over Leader Brothers, or you could not go to law school and take over Leader Brothers. <laughs> Those were my <laughs> first choices. So, but, but I knew it wasn't for me. And again, I, I told you I grew up in a pretty working class, blue collar like we weren't poor, but we definitely lived like we were poor, which is why I've always been interested in in the psychology of money, which I'm sure we'll get into. So I was one of five. My parents were 17 and 18 when they got married. They had th- five children before they were 30. They had no parenting skills to speak of. Neither did their parents. My father's parents really didn't even speak English. Where were they from? My father's parents, uh, Russia and Romania. My mother's uh, parents were born were born in America, but were profoundly uh, difficult. Both my parents were fleeing abusive families. 
Yeah. And um, so there were five of us and my parents were overwhelmed. And if we wanted to do anything, it was on us. You want to play hockey, walk to the rink. You want to play baseball, ride your bike to the park. They weren't, they weren't engaged in, you know, curating our childhoods by any means with one notable exception, which was anything I wanted to do that was involved the synagogue. Somehow they found a way to get me there and get me home. And, uh, that was sort of the one acceptable creative pursuit or non-academic pursuit. Um, and I found it to be for me, a very elevated place. Uh, a place devoid of chaos, a place with learned people, a place that valued books. Um, you know, I've written five books and at 15, if, I mean, writing a book and seeing it on the shelf was about the most elevated thing a person could ever do, given where I came from. I, I actually thought, now, this was a foolish thought in retrospect, but I actually, as a kid, grew up dreaming about a job where I had to wear a suit and a tie because I thought that that's making it. Of course, wow. now I hate it, but, yeah. but I, 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 <laughs> you've I, moved past that, right? <laughs> yeah. I've evolved. I've evolved. Thanks to COVID, by the way, it did take the kick in the ass from COVID to help me stop worrying so much about dressing the part or what other people might think of me based on whatever, kabuki costume I was wearing that day because there's a lot of kabuki in my job. What, so the backstory is, first of all, I was the kid who loved being up there for his bar mitzvah. I loved I loved everything about it. I, I read my poetry to my family and friends at 13. I inflicted my 13-year-old poetry on, on them with my adolescent angst. And I just thought it was the greatest thing up there. And then when I was 14, I was playing uh, I was in junior high school, ninth grade. I was playing drums in a rock and roll band and smoking weed every day. And my parents were pretty unaware because my grades were were good and they, they just weren't paying a lot of attention. They were kind of done parenting. And then I got arrested for shoplifting Bob Dylan albums with my bandmates from Target when I was 14. And my parents were on vacation in Miami. My older sister, oldest sister, Marilyn, had to get me out of the Huskar, the Huskow, the St. Louis Park County Jail and uh, <laughs> the police station. Ugh. I had to call my parents. They had to come home. To make a long story short, they realized that they should probably start paying attention to me. And they made the decision to send me to this Jewish summer camp in Wisconsin, in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. And from the moment I stepped off the bus, I loved everything about it. Everything. Uh, I I loved the the hippie counselors who loved the music I loved. I loved writing our own services. I loved growing our own food in the garden and living in a big tent. And and I it was the first time in my life I ever saw a rabbi in shorts and a t shirt who could throw a baseball. I couldn't believe it. I thought, wait a minute. Rabbis can be normal people and <laughs> still be a part of this elevated way of thinking and believing and expressing oneself. Um, and honestly, I never looked back from the time I was 15. I just, that was it for me. And um, I've had that feeling really three times in my entire life. Uh, that was the first where I just knew with absolute clarity, this is for me. Uh, and and I've never looked back and it's it's been a very difficult and demanding experience, but also one that has enabled me to make a difference in ways I, I never imagined I could have. Sure. So you were a young boy go to the Jewish summer camp and you go, man, this is, this is the way of life for me. Did you know in that moment that you wanted to become a rabbi too? You know, I think it's a combination, Sanger, of intuition and grooming. Because once a kid like me shows up in that environment and takes to it, then the environment begins to groom you to, yeah. to 
age in it more deeply. And I don't mean groom as in a as in any kind of pejorative way. It's just, you know, it became my community. It became my friendship circle. It became where I could express myself and and was encouraged. And I think the part that also worked for me was unlike previously where I was encouraged I was celebrated and encouraged for doing the wrong things. Suddenly, I was in an environment where I was celebrated and encouraged for doing the right things. And I felt better about myself. And that's part of it, too. And when you talk about doing the wrong things and the right things, was that something that you were aware of when you were a teenager? And knowing the distinct difference, hey, my my Jewish faith is clearly telling me that, hey, Smoke and weed still in Bob Marley CDs is the wrong Bob, way to Bob go. Dylan. Oh, way, Bob Dylan. Yeah. <laughs> Dylan, for the record. Oh, Although, okay. let's get it. Not, right. a bad, not a bad second choice. Not a bad it second would be, Somehow it's worse to steal a Bob Marley CD. <laughs> 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 is, is, is it? Is that just, just more stoner? One. Is that a photo of Dylan behind you on your, behind yeah. your, over your left shoulder? <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait. He paid for that. Yeah. Is that the album you took? All right. There's the there Bob Dylan go. album. Oh, wow. Oh, so nice. Nice. That's a, very cool. Yes, it is. I think the the best concert I ever went to was six or seven years ago at a winery outside of Seattle, and it was Bob Dylan mumbling his way through his set yeah. on stage. Yeah, but a kick ass band. This is so cool. A band, right? Yeah, it was. It was neat. It was like see, seeing a living living legend. That yeah. and maybe seeing Willie Nelson were. Yeah. We're up there. Oh, that's that's awesome. Anyway, that's awesome. Um, so, did I know? Look, let's start with the fact that no thirteen-year-old's brain or fourteen-year-old's brain is fully yeah, cooked. Sure. So, did I know? Sort of. Did I not realize? Sort of. Um, I was a typical teenager. You know, every every teenager does does stupid stuff. So, um, and and I continue to do stupid stuff. But at least the guardrails are 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 different and something I'm more comfortable with. Sure. I, I was interested in that because today the Jewish commu- community is facing, you know, there's a resurgence of a long, you know, millennia old conflict in the Levant. And a lot of people on both sides frame it as an issue of right and wrong. And so I'm interested in where you derive your sense of right and wrong. I mean, I understand the answer is going to be be God, but what's the next answer beyond that? Or maybe well, a better question is, what does it mean to derive your sense of right and wrong from God? Well, let's start with this. First of all, I don't think right and wrong or good and bad is a line that separates one group of people from another. I don't sure. think that the world is made up of good people over here and bad people over there. Yeah, I the agree. Line, and, and this is from Alexander Solzhenitsyn, the Soviet dissident who wrote the Gulag trilogy and he knew something about evil. I mean, he ate rats to stay alive in the, in the Gulag. Solzhenitsyn said the line between good and evil is not a line between us and them, but a line that runs right down the center of every person. And in my view, there are multiple times a day when we're engaged in an internal dialogue about which side of that line we're going to be on in that moment. And yeah. so I think this is as much an internal struggle as an external struggle. And I think it's very important to disambiguate when you're talking about the Middle East. By disambiguate, I mean to avoid conflation. There's this old Yiddish expression I love, which is a half truth is a whole lie. Okay. And for what you guys do for a living, you know that's true. Yeah, that's for sure. Right? A uh, half truth. You look at half the data and tell your client they're doing great. That's a whole lie. Okay. Yeah. That's a half truth. That's a whole lie. So when we conflate, when we're talking about the Middle East, we tend to obscure the basic truths that need to be faced. And in this particular, and I know this isn't a podcast on current events in the Middle East, but the way I look at it is I disambiguate, I, I deconflate, I separate. So, very quickly, I'll say this much. Let's begin with the fact that Palestinians have been the doormat of the Middle East for 75 years or longer. They've been a political football, they've suffered terribly, and they deserve much better. They deserve 
better from their own leadership, which I don't think they will ever get. They deserve better from their Arab brethren, which I don't think they will ever get. I mean, you know, Gaza has a border with Egypt also, that, and Egypt's closer to their border. They're not taking anyone in. Jordan's not taking anyone in. So they deserve better from their own. They deserve better from Israel, and they deserve better from us and the EU and the entire West. They do. Now, here's the word that disambiguates. However, betterment of the Palestinian people has nothing to do with Hamas and October 7th, 2023. Nothing. Because Hamas's mission is not the betterment of the Palestinian people. Hamas's mission, and you can look at Article 7 of the Hamas Covenant, Hamas's mission is dead Jews. That's their mission, not the betterment of Palestinians. If their mission was the betterment of Palestinians, they would not have attacked Israel and provoked what they provoked. They would not be hiding behind and underneath a blanket of civilians. And Gaza would be a second Singapore and not the hellhole that it is. Yeah. This is not an issue of occupation. We have to disambiguate occupation too. There hasn't been a Jew living in Gaza, other than Jews who were kidnapped by Hamas, since 2005. So for 18 years, there has been the opportunity to create another Singapore, Oceanside resorts, desalinization plants, solar farms, world-class universities and hospitals and parks and fields, you name it. It's about the same size as Singapore. But that didn't happen because that wasn't the mission of the leadership. The mission of the leadership was to use as, uh, all resources yeah. to kill Jews, to murder Jews. So um, I think we really need to, that's not, and now why am I saying this? You asked me, how do I differentiate right from wrong? That's not a difficult thing when you disambig disambiguate, when you stop yeah. confirmating and telling half-truths. It's very easy to separate right from wrong. Well, I assume that you would have a more nuanced take and you're a smart guy, a deep thinker. That's I'm noticing there's a lack of that thoughtfulness when it comes to this discussion. And maybe it's not unique to the situation in Gaza. It's more representative of discourse in our current world. Um, yes. But people yes. seem very, even, even people who are... Um, maybe you could say pro-Israel there. I, I don't see a lot of thoughtful commentary from there. Well, they're, they're, those people are bad. These people are good. Um, maybe they don't even necessarily draw the line at people, but the, those ideas are good. These ideas are bad. And and there's yeah. not a lot of nuance, not a lot of understanding. And you're right. Can, that's when we can start to excuse evil behavior because that's if right. we're the good guys that are the bad guys, uh, whatever we do is fine. And, and I well, see people defend... And Defend and Hamas, are, openly defend Hamas, which is shocking. And there are, and there are bad guys, but yeah. that, that doesn't include all Palestinians. And um, I, I think, look, there are so many problems. Most of the people out there marching couldn't find Gaza or Israel on a map. Sure. They have no idea. Okay, they're sheep. And, um, and completely um, acting in a way that's antithetical to their professed values. Any any feminist who is marching for Hamas is a feminist marching for rape. Any LGBTQ plus person marching for Hamas, and there are many, would be would have their genitals cut off, be murdered and beheaded in Gaza, or thrown off a tall building. And yet there they are marching. And what this says to me is... A, they're graduates of TikTok University, and they don't know very much. And B, they are incapable of disambiguating, or worse, this is the third option, which is the one that really is frightening for me and for many Jews, and for many good people everywhere, or their Jew hatred is so powerful that it subordinates all the other values they profess to believe in. And that's the scariest option and reality. And for some people, that is absolutely true. And yeah. you're right. That is the oldest of stories. When when we look at people like that, 
it's easy to dismiss them and go out there. What a what a rudimentary level of thinking. I mean, they don't even they're not even aligned in their they're not even consistent and aligned in their own beliefs and actions. Ah, uh, and and dismiss them as not very smart, not very thoughtful, or just morally evil, which they could be, right? Or or and maybe they're all of those things. But I look at it as a warning for myself and go, wow, this is what happens when when you allow hatred in your heart. This is what happens when you um when you don't have the clarity of thought that you articulated on the topic, when you don't disambiguate, I too can be just as capable of having a belief that is counter to other more important beliefs. I can act out things that are contrary to my deeply held beliefs. I can, I am capable of evil. Yes, um, you're also capable of feeling that lack of alignment. Yeah, yeah. That's what's missing. Okay, that's what's missing in some people. They they cannot f- even have the internal conversation with themselves that says, "I'm doing this, and I'm doing it uh, for reasons I can't quite understand. Maybe anger, maybe jealousy, but it is inconsistent with my best self." They can't even have that conversation because they lack the awareness. You know, my, what, my, is, one it, of my is favorite, it purely a lack of awareness or no, some are really hate filled yeah. and, some, and sure. some are just look here. We know this from psychology. People in groups lose their minds. Yeah. Okay. Group think is idiocy. And, and, and when I say sheep, that's really what I, what I mean. I don't mean to dehumanize. I mean that, that people in groups lose their critical thinking. Um, one of my favorite quotes is by Marshall McLuhan, a Canadian philosopher who said, I don't know who discovered water, but it wasn't the fish. So so when you look at somebody like that, no, nobody wants to be in a situation where they are on the wrong side of good and evil. Nobody wants to be in a situation where they've uh, given away their their decision-making to the group. Nobody wants to be in a situation where they are lacking self-awareness how do you think we avoid that minefield? As I said, you know, I don't know who discovered water, but it wasn't the fish. And what McLuhan was saying is that we are so immersed in our own reality, we have no perspective on it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to an answer which might surprise you, Sean. So a fish is born in water, lives in water, dies in water, and therefore, oddly enough, is completely unaware that it exists in water. It's all it's ever known. When does a fish discover water? It's out of when it. it. When it's jerked out of it at the end of a hook, wriggling and grasping for air, uh, you know, and, and just gasping on the banks. That's when a fish goes, oh my goodness, I was in water. So it, it requires some disruptive event, some punctuating of the equilibrium. You know, um, biologists... If you ask most people how to describe evolution, they'll draw an ever uh, an ascending line, right? That's evolution. It goes up and up and up and up. But many biologists believe in something different, which is called punctuated equilibrium. So that we we plateau and then something punctuates the equilibrium and we shoot up in an evolutionary way or we decline in a terrible evolutionary way. Uh, An asteroid hits the earth and the dinosaurs are gone right? Boom. It punctuated the equilibrium, caused a massive change. And that's what it takes for people to become self-aware. I'm sure that your clients have had events either in their financial life or family life, since you deal with family businesses, that is so disruptive that it causes them to wake up. And what Hamas did, for example, for Jews on October 7th was a wake-up call, definitely for my kids' generation, who for whom talking about, not my kids personally, but their friends, talking, oh, about, sure. Israel, talking about Israel with the Holocaust is like talking about the Peloponnesian Wars or something. You know, it's, it's not in their water. It's not in their existence and their reality. So this is a wake-up call. Every generation of Jews, every generation of Americans... Every investor, every parent, every child gets a wake-up call. 
And as I often like to say, I said it in one of my books, the goal now to answer your question, Sean, is if you have to go through hell, don't come out empty-handed. This is a wake-up call that teaches us about group think. This is a wake-up call that has impelled me to speak out in ways I never have before. I've always avoided anything remotely political. I deal in the world of, of psychology, money, pain, loss, grief, rebirth, those kinds of things. I never wanted to be a spokesperson uh, against terrorism and and Jew hatred. That wasn't my thing, but I've had a wake-up call too. It's like you have a platform. If you don't use it for this, who are you? Well, do, do these transformative events, these, yeah. these points of punctuated equilibrium, always have to involve suffering or can we can we create these on our own so that we advance forward to a greater awareness with absent the suffering uh there are a few but they too in their own way eventually involve some kind of pain and suffering because honestly i t- i don't mean to be glib and i i'm i'm rem- i'm disambiguating and removing nuance here but pain is the only teacher it is the only teacher and I've learned that over many, many years as a rabbi, as a person who studies pain and loss, as a, as a husband, as a father, as a son, pain is the great teacher. And that doesn't mean that these painful experiences are worth it. I'm not saying that for a moment. All I'm saying is we ought not let them become worthless. Because this yeah. this is the fuel of life itself. You know, e- even death, which I write about a lot. Kafka was right. He said the meaning of life is that it ends. And it's so true. A deathless life would be a meaningless life. And there's pain in that and motivation in that and beauty in that. You know, when you asked, does it always have to be painful? I was thinking, well, when we become a parent, which is a beautiful experience, beautiful transcendent or when we fall deeply in love with someone my wife and i got engaged on our second date oh that, wow that disruptive experience is so beautiful and generative but the journey as a result of that includes pain i don't know a parent who hasn't suffered for and because of a child i don't know a child that hasn't suffered I mean, there wouldn't be a therapist working in the world if not for cognitive dissonance when it comes to our parents. I don't know a child who doesn't suffer down in the basement of their psyche because of their parents. I don't know a couple that stays married that hasn't gotten through some profound suffering. The question is, what do you make of it? So you you illustrated a couple of moments, like becoming a parent, that seemed to me like they could be an event of that punctuated equilibrium with within one's own spiritual, emotional development. Correct. So there are good things that can happen. Now, I'm not a parent, but I've certainly heard that it comes with a lot of suffering, and I think I impose some of that on my parents. <laughs> but it's not in and of itself, you know, uh, uh, no, a, no, it's no. not suffering in and of itself. It, so, it, its essence isn't suffering. Yeah, right. so how can we, how can I find those things? Because if what you're telling me is, hey, if I want to grow spiritually, And I come to you and I say, you're a religious leader, a religious man, a wise man. Help me become more spiritually aligned. I'm assuming you're going to tell me, hey, well, one way is you can wait around and have a bad moment of suffering and punctuated equilibrium that could cause you to change. And learn from it. And then learn from it. I go, I could. One one downside of that is it may not come until it's too late, right? The second is... It could be really, really bad. I don't want it to be that bad. I would rather curate something that I know is going to have some suffering, right? But the suffering is going to be good for me and in akin to like getting in a cold plunge. Yeah, it's actually- Okay, that's going to hurt. It's going to- Example, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to go work out. The workout's going to be hard. It's going to hurt. I'm going to be sore, but I would choose that over the alternative. Yes. So what are some things for, whether it's spiritual, spiritual development- or emotional development um, that can help us as in our unique roles as uh, within our family and our yeah. roles within our business and just as individuals, how do I curate that moment? Well, I don't think you can curate 
these moments. You tell me I can't control everything. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, dang it. It's, it's a new revelation. Oh. Right. Yeah. Welcome to spirituality. Um, but, yeah. but you can embrace them. And here's what I mean by that. Now we're going to go pretty deep here to what I think is the essence of spirituality and what has taken me most of my life to come to this realization and point. I think that the fuel of life itself is duality. There is a duality to everything. There's a dichotomous tension to it all. And that tension, in my view, sort of is the high wire on which we walk through life. So for me, and I can only speak personally, I am most spiritually connected when I am when I make peace with this idea that all is one, that the duality, what the things we perceive as irreconcilable, let's take memory, for example. Um, you may or may not know one of my books is about um, what I learned from my father's 10-year journey through Alzheimer's and what Steve Leader, the rabbi, thought he knew and what Steve Leader, the son, actually found out about things like memory. So uh, clergy are full of platitudes about memory, full of, you know, may his memory be a blessing. You'll always have her in your memories, okay? And it's true that memory is beautiful, powerful, but it is equally true, and here's the duality, that it really, really hurts. It's both. It's like being caressed and spat on at the same time. That's memory. That's duality. Now, what do we do with that as human beings? We either feel like, hey, this is unfair. This is irreconcilable and I can't stand the irreconcilable nature of these dualities. I'm going to die. Life is meaningful because I'm going to die. Life means nothing because I'm going to die. These dualities, which are irreconcilable, for me, when I think about them and I accept them and make peace with the irreconcilable nature of these dualities, for me, that is a reconciliation. That is becoming whole. When we make peace with the dualities of life. And I, I that's probably not exactly the answer you were looking for, but Sanger, you're going to dis you're going to feel these dualities in almost everything in your life. And they cannot be reconciled. And and we move from intelligence to wisdom when we make peace with the oneness of what seems so fractured. So accepting it and not attempting to basically do what I was saying with my question, which is to find the way to get the get the good without the bad. Uh, find a way to be. How can I be a parent without uh, having really low lows? How can I? Um, yeah. How can I get in physical shape without exercise? Like accepting accepting both ends. Yes. And being at peace with that. That's the way. That is the way. And did you I'll, find that that perspective? Go ahead. Go ahead, Sean. Go ahead. Well, I, I just dad to dad here. Um, how, how old are you, Sanger? 29. 29. So I have a 31-year-old and 34-year-old. And Sean, how old are you? I'm 59. Okay. So I'm 63. So we're pretty- Yeah. We're in the- We're pretty here. close. Pretty close. Many years ago, and I, I'm telling you this story to be comforting to you, Sean. Many okay. years ago, I started a men's group called 100 Jewish Men lasted for 15 years. We got together once a month and we talked about issues that were important to men that men would never openly discuss if there were women in the room. And one of the exercises we did was called an age wheel. There were three generations. There were men from 80 to 25 in the group. So we created a circle with the youngest person, next oldest, next oldest, next oldest, all the way around in a circle. So the oldest and youngest were shoulder to shoulder at the end of the circle being made. And then yeah. we had an opportunity to ask men across from us questions. So we were talking to men 15, 20, 30 years older or younger than we were. 
So I looked at all the guys. I was in my 30s. I looked at all the guys your age, Sean, across the circle from me. And I said, you know, I've only been a rabbi for a few years. But I have realized, even in a few years, that the the most at peace men I know are men in their 60s and 70s. And is there anything you guys over there can tell all of us over here in our 30s about how to achieve that without having to live all the years it takes to get to your side of the circle? And 20 yeah. guys 20 guys went like this. <laughs> <laughs> so that's part of it too, Sean, is it's a, it's a journey and there's no real shortcut. I've always wanted to write a book called How to Have Your Second Child First because <laughs> right? it's such a great title. And if, the second is so much less fraught with anxiety and worry and all of that. But you can't have your second child first. There are things that can only be achieved through experience. And, and Yeah, you know, in, in our business, you know, I, th I think there – there are people who focus a lot on the retirement phase of life and sort of getting to that point and missing out on the the richness of the journey of getting there, you know, the, yeah, the good and the bad, right? There's nothing you can tell them. They have to live it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you remember yeah, when I had, told you there were three times in my life that I had absolute clarity? Yes. The first was when I was 15 at that camp. The second was when my wife walked into the room when we first met. I was done. The barometric pressure of the universe changed. And in a couple of weeks, we'll be celebrating our 38th anniversary. And I still, I still, my heart skips a beat when she walks in the room. The, the third time, which was fairly recent, was when I realized I needed to retire because I was burnt out. I just knew it. I just knew it. When the phone rang and it was a funeral, and my first reaction was, shit, I don't want to do that. I wanted to watch a Vikings game on Sunday. Damn it. <laughs> right. And when that was my first reaction, as opposed to a, a an impulse of empathy, which I got to, of course, but that's when I realized, dude, you're done. You got to do something else. It's not, you should never do this job for money. And you're heading in that direction of doing this job because you're afraid to quit and you got to stop. Yeah. We, we shouldn't do any job for money, but a job with the um, reverent responsibility of a rabbi in any religion. Yeah, you definitely leader. don't want Ooh, your, you don't want your religious leader no, it for the money. <laughs> there are definitely, I've met some uh, pastors for sure that do it for money. <laughs> oh, my. exist. So um, have I. But you you wrote a book, um, More Money Than God, and it, the focus of the book is how to how to be wealthy, how to have money without um losing your soul. You know, yeah, losing your soul, losing yourself. And and that's something that I find a lot of religious people who have wealth struggle with. So yes, I'm interested in in talking with you about that. Yes. What was going on in your life that made that something that you wanted to write about? And then what did you learn through that process? Yeah. Well, I remember it very distinctly. First of all, that book was written when the dot-com bubble blew up. And a lot of very wealthy people lost a lot of money. And I saw what it did to them. And I was relatively young. This is true, I think, of, of any big city clergy person or wealthy suburb clergy person. Like I'm not poor. I make it, you know, I'm fine, but I am surrounded by people with extraordinarily more money than I have. I mean, extraordinarily more as are you guys. I'm sure yeah. your clients yeah. every day, every day with people who, you know, who have achieved a level of wealth through their own merits or inheritance or, you know, or they're just lucky their parents were born before them and started the business that they're in now in. Yeah. But so you've had this feeling too, I'm sure, um, of being surrounded by extraordinary wealth and yet getting to see the inside of people's lives and how 
unhappy some of them were. For sure. I, I have that perspective. You know, I, I'm with, I was back then much younger. It's still, I'd meet with a yeah. family to prepare them for a funeral the next day for this extraordinarily wealthy person who turns out to, you know, have, have been, uh, ha- to have been a less than wonderful person, um, or an empty person or a depressed person. And, and I also, because I'm in Los Angeles, I was, you know, I grew up in Minnesota. I didn't like the idea in Minnesota was to stay one step behind your neighbor. Keep your head down. The tall flower gets clipped. Don't be too ambitious. Mm-hmm. Take, just, you know, go to the Not junkyard. Not so much in LA, right? <laughs> exactly. So I come to LA where the opposite, where people are, are kiting checks to, to, you know, to be important on the outside. And it occurred to me that people are deifying the material. That in our world, we deify the material. We grant to objects the power our ancestors ascribed to God. Just to give you a quick example, I do a whole talk about this. I've spoken to many wealth management conferences about this. Just as an example, take any advertising slogan for any product you can think of, Take out the name of the product and put the word God in, and you'll see how we deify the material. For example, um, like a good neighbor, <laughs> God's there. State Farm you're is in, good, yeah. You're, you're yeah. in good hands with, yeah, yeah, with God. My daughter, when she was a teenager, came home with a three hundred dollar pair of jeans that I was not so happy about. Guess what the jeans were called? You're not going to believe this. What? True religion genes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. And and think about LA as the manufacturing center for all these TV shows that have different titles, yeah. but the subtext is identical. The titles change. You know, Biggest Loser, um, Cosmetic surgery shows, decorating shows, queer eye for the straight guy, home home renovation, all of it. Okay, they all have different titles, but the subtext for all of them is: if you change your outer life, it will change your inner life. That your outer life is your inner life. That's idolatry, and yeah. it's a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. That's why people have to go back for more and more cosmetic surgery. Because it doesn't fill you up. I tell people, believing that material things, and I like nice things as much as the next guy. Don't get me wrong. I'm not disparaging money or the power of money. I'm asking people to be thoughtful about it. Get out of the water and look at it. And if you fall prey to the belief that what you have is who you are, that your outer material life is your inner life, that's like trying to eat a picture of food. It's close, but it's empty. And that's why I got interested in this whole subject, which is by no means a new subject uh, in in the history of thought and religion. And again, I am not disparaging the power of money. Money has real power. Money can educate you. Money can keep you alive. Try being sick in this country without money. Money can protect you, right? Money can educate you. Money can uplift the fallen, the poor, the hungry, the homeless. Money has real power. That's why it's such a seductive target for idolatry. Yeah, money's a tool and... Any tool, any powerful tool could be used for good and it could be used for evil, right? Even a, a spiritual tool. Well, oh, he's a wonderful orator. You can use your words for evil. Um, Correct. You can use your charm for evil. Um, you can use your intelligence for evil. You can use your physical body for evil. So you could use your money for for things that are evil or, or even unfulfilling. And, I, and, and not even realize it. And oh, not yeah. Even- and... and in this culture, it's 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 very clear, and I think it's interesting that uh, at least within the Christian church, you know, I haven't been to many synagogues, but it it seems 
that the increase in our materialist culture has corresponded with a lack of sacred objects in the church. You can go to a church and it's completely empty inside of an, like an old strip mall. Uh, there's not even a cross on the walls. There, the walls are painted gray and there's a big stage with speakers. That's it. And then outside, oh, let's adorn ourselves with nice things and have a nice car and a nice house. So I think when there, it seems to be there's a correlation when there's a lack of sacred um, and, and there's a lack of material honoring God, then we try to go find and fixate on the material elsewhere. I'll go, I'll go a layer deeper than that, which is I don't think it's the material that honors God in any way in the first place. It is the non-material. Uh, this, the first time in the Hebrew Bible, the word holy is used. Uh, I don't, I don't know your guy's background. Are you like religious dudes or not so much? I would, I would say we're religious uh, dudes. Yeah. Christian guys that grew up in Texas. Yeah. So yeah. In the, <laughs> the best of both worlds. The, the belt. Love that. Yeah, the, 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 the buckle, Texas, the buckle yeah. of the Bible belt. Man. Got it. Got it. My first, my student pulpit was in Sherman, Texas. Nice. So I, I know a little bit about it. Um, look, the first time the word holy is used in the Hebrew Bible is not in relation to an object, a thing, a noun. It's, and God rested on the seventh day and declared it holy. It's not, it's not a thing, not human beings, yeah. not animals, not rocks, not the sun. It's time. It's moments. Those are the great religious cathedrals, moments in time. I'm paraphrasing Abraham Joshua Heschel here in his book on the Sabbath. So I, I would say this is also what has enabled for Judaism for sure to survive. Because if, if Judaism was dependent upon holy objects or places only or mostly, we'd be gone because we've yeah. been kicked all over the globe. But the Nazis cannot destroy the Sabbath. You can't destroy Yom Kippur. You can't destroy values. And, and so we can go even deeper. And this is, again, why this subject of, of money interests me so much. Because you're right, Sean, it is... And, and Sanger, I meant to say you're right, Sanger. Sean, you're never right. Sanger. <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm used to that. Yeah, yeah. You're right that adornment is another kind of form of idolatry, self. Yeah. You know, I've built some amazing buildings for our congregation, not, not myself. I've raised the money to pay other people to build them. And... I am constantly reminding people the building is merely a vessel. Sure. You know, there's another great line in the Bible when, when God tells Moses to say to the people, build me a sanctuary so that I may dwell among them. Not within it, not within the sanctuary. It doesn't say build me a sanctuary so I may dwell within it. It says build me a sanctuary so I may dwell within them, the builders. That that's that it's a vessel for spirituality. The thing itself is not what it's about. So what do you think is the biggest key for people to manage their money and, and maybe even wealthy people to manage their money without losing who they are and without veering off track? So I encourage, and this again is part of what I do when I talk to groups about this. And I've been doing this all over the world, really, for years. So there's this thing called an ethical will. It dates back a thousand years to the 11th century. Uh, Jews created ethical wills, which were parallel documents to their material wills. Most of your clients, I would bet all of your clients have an estate plan. I'll yes. bet almost none of them have a corollary document, ethical will, or legacy letter to their loved ones Correct. about <laughs> the values they want to bequeath to them. So I I have a program process. I there's a book called For You When I Am Gone, which is about this. And I'm not hawking my book. I'm answering your question honestly. 
Yeah. It's a series of 12 questions to ask yourself and answer for yourself truthfully to create the story of your life that you want to bequeath to the people you love when you're gone. Now, when you do that, it's doing two things. First of all, it is avoiding what happens in most families, which is the last word most people ever leave for their loved ones, the final thing your kids hear from from you for most people is a legalese document written by someone who barely knew you that is entirely about who gets what and when and how much, as if somehow the material will express the spiritual yeah. and the emotional. Right? That's your final word to your kids? Really? Who gets the stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Right. And nobody wants your crap anyway, honestly. Right. They don't want the paperweights or the pen collection or the whatever. They don't care. So, what do I want? What do I have? What do I miss about my dad? I mean, one of the saddest images in my brain is of going down into the basement of my parents' townhouse after my dad died. My mom said, Stephen, go downstairs and take anything of dad's you want. And my father's stuff was in a heap on the floor. But that wasn't his legacy. So when you create this document, your your final words to your loved ones when you're gone are really the treasures they really want and need, the things that will nurture and sustain them. That's number one. But if you do this thing now, you're also creating the truth you say you live by, and you get to hold that sort of MRI of your inner life up to the light and ask yourself what I think is the most important question any human being can ask, which is, this is what I say my truth is. This is what I say I believe and and have lived and died for. My whole life. Am I living it? Or is my life mostly pretend? That's a powerful question for your clients. Because then what you get to do in terms of advising your clients about their money is, okay, this is your truth. Now let's look at your checkbook and see if it's aligned with your truth. Yeah. So, so I work with a lot of people on, on looking at building legacy plans like that, like, like what you've talked about. And when we look at transferring values on to the next generation, transferring those values to the people that you, you know and care about, one of the ways that we can do that is through our philanthropy, through that final document to say, I, you know, I bequeath this to this cause, this, uh, this charity, this organization that reflects my values. Yep. Are there are there other ways that you're thinking that that people can do that that can be as effective? Yes. What do you do with your time? How did you spend your time with your loved ones? Were you serving Thanksgiving dinner at a shelter? Were you uh, visiting places where there are poor people and exposing your children to the world? Now, the sentence I'm about to utter, I know sounds ridiculous, but I'm going to say it anyway, because you guys are in the business, you'll understand. The hardest working billionaire I know, and the most thoughtful billionaire philanthropist I know, I asked him one time, I said, how did you turn out this way? And he said, my father had me at the family philanthropy table when I was five years old. And if I didn't understand something that was happening, he would stop the entire meeting and explain it to me. Mm. So modeling while you're alive, it's not so much what you give when you're dead that will teach your loved ones or bequeath something to your loved ones. It will help in the world, of course. But you should be living, live the way you die and die the way you live. So it's, it's action. It's, it, were you writing checks when you were 30, 35, 40, 45? Did your kids give a third of their allowance away? Did they earn that allowance? Uh, you know, it's, 
have you raised your children to understand the difference between need and want, even if, especially if, you can afford whatever they want, and they're going to roll their eyes? It's a challenge when your kids know you can afford whatever they want. How do you it's, raise it's a, a It's a challenge with kids who want you know the latest and greatest, and they want what they want when they want it. Yes. But also living in an environment, like you were talking about earlier, living in, in L.A., where all of their friends have something that they want to be a part of. They want to be part of the group. They want to feel valued and, and have esteem in their social circle. And it's hard to say no. Um, yeah, I remember one of the things that that we did when, when our kids were growing up is, you know, Sanger knows this well. I said, you got you to earn and pay for your first car. And you, you did that. I, I know you, you didn't probably, you would have preferred to sort of have one handed to you, but not a, at the time that would have been cooler, but <laughs> driving that old beat up Jeep Wrangler was pretty sweet. And you yeah. felt good, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I immediately had, uh, I immediately felt sad for my friends that just got like a new Range Rover. Like, oh dude. Did you really, did you at the time? You yeah. Felt yeah. Sad? Yeah. Like once I went before I got my car, I was like, oh, that'd be cool. And then as soon as I got mine and I see them with theirs, I was like, oh, dude, this is not even your car. This yeah. one's mine. That's right. That's right. And so it's a good example of, you know, this want versus need and this idea of material things having real value and spiritual value or saying anything about who you are. These are things that you can start very early on. And, you know, it's amazing to me that parents, if their kid comes home from kindergarten and, and, and tells them an incredibly racist joke, parents will engage with that child and talk about it and educate that child. If a child comes home and says something incredibly sexist to his mother, which my kid tried when he was five years old, He's going to get educated. But when a kid comes home and says, Daddy, um, Joey's daddy has 10 cars. You know what parents say? Nothing. Or they celebrate it. Really? That's incredible. Oh, they must be so rich. What kind of cars are they? We don't want to engage when it comes to materialism because it's the last allowable ism in our culture. And I don't understand why that is. Well, I do. I do understand that if I engage with my daughter or son about sexism or racism or any other ism other than materialism, I'm, I'm not risking judgment from others. But if I engage with my daughter when she comes home and talks about the 10 cars and I say, Hannah, let me ask you something. How many cars can a person drive at one time? One, daddy. Okay, let's let's think about how much money nine other cars cost, and let's think about how many homeless people could we feed with that money? Well, I don't know a lot, daddy. Yeah. Now, what's the risk? The risk is Hannah's going to go back to kindergarten the next day, and she's going to say, Joey, my daddy thinks your daddy has bad values. Okay, <laughs> that's the risk. That's the risk. Why am I willing, why are parents willing to take that risk with sexism or racism or homophobia, but they're not willing to take that risk with crass materialism? And I know what you're thinking. What you're thinking is, but Rabbi, how do we, who are we to judge? I mean, maybe, maybe Joey's daddy gives millions every year to charity. So give him his 10 cars. Who cares? I agree with you that it's not a clear line. I also know it's like it's like what Justice Potter Stewart said about when he was asked by the Supreme Court to define obscenity. Uh, it was a pornography case. Was this film art mm -hmm. or was it obscene? And Justice Potter Stewart said, I can't define it, but I know when I see it. So you may not be able to define what's over the line, but you know when you see it. And if you're not engaging with your kids about that or your grandchildren about that, you are setting them up. 
on a dangerous path. Yeah. What, what do you think um, is the most important decision we can make relative to our, our wealth? That's such a good question. If I had to, is it aligned? Is your is your money where your heart is? Not where your mouth is. Not where your neighbor is. Is your money aligned with your heart? And if not, why? Because the, the unhappiest people I know are people whose professed values and lived values are not the same. That's a horrible think, way to think, live. I, I think most people's money is aligned with where their heart is. And then the, the question becomes, is their heart in the right spot? Well, and, and maybe it I needs that transformative event. I think a lot well, of by default. No, not by default. Most pe- I don't think people by default spend money on the thing uh, in alignment with their heart. I think a lot of times people spend money on what they think they're supposed to. They think based well, then on that's what where, they, That's where their heart is. No, that's it, isn't. Point. No, it isn't. If no. they're materialistic, then their heart is there. It shouldn't be, not all but it. they're spending their money there. No, I don't yeah, think so. If you, if you ask a materialistic person if things are the most important to them in their lives, they'll say, no, they're not. But they're acting no, like they Most are. people aren't, aren't self-aware enough to recognize that. Right. And so the most important, that's what I guess then you and I are arriving at the same answer to your question, which is, I guess the answer is true self-awareness. That's what I meant yeah. by is your money where your heart is. Not where society is, not where your friends are. Is it where your heart is? Now, if you are a crass, shallow person because of some tortured childhood trauma or whatever, oh, okay, you're gonna you're gonna use your money for, you know, foolish uh or selfish reasons. And again, I am not disparaging the power of money. I like money as much as the next guy. But I want the way I use it to be consistent with the real Steve. Sure. And maybe there's a difference between what you are doing and what you're expressing and what you're behaving and what you would express, do, and behave if you are acting out your ideal, if you are perfectly embodying your values. Yeah, my my, my point a, is... Yeah. My, my, There's my a difference is, between the real and the ideal and finding the ideal and aligning the real with the ideal is the answer. Is, is that you can tell a lot about somebody and how they're spending their money. It reveals yes. where they place their importance. Where I spend my wealth is where I see value. This is where I'm getting something out of that that is important to me. And I think what's important is to evaluate, is that what should truly be important to me? And is there a disconnect between what I tell myself about myself, my, my self-talk and those actions. And if those are misaligned, then I have a problem. And, and my, my point is that you can really tell about some, yeah. something about somebody and, and where they spend that wealth, where they direct it. When I talk to heads of development for major philanthropies, I ask them to put their donors through this experience. And then ask the donor, does your philanthropy reflect what you are saying are your most deeply held and cherished values? Or are we misaligned? Now, no one is perfectly aligned, Sanger, to your point. We never achieve the the ideal. Never. But the unhappiest people are the most out of alignment and the people who are most content are people whose professed values and lived values are are pretty well aligned most of the time. We all stumble. We all do things we're not proud of. But generally speaking, the closer in alignment we are, look, I'll put it in religious terms for both of you, the closer we are to God. That's how I see it. Yeah, I, I think what, what I see most often, I, do, I don't see very often someone who's living a life where their values are in conflict with their actions. But what I see more often are people who are living a life where they have values that are even expressed values and that those values do not have an outlet 
in action. I, I can't point to anything that exemplifies this value that you're professing. Right, right. right. Not living them. You say, you, you tell your kids to be nice to their siblings and you haven't called your own sister in two years. Really? Right. Really? You know, yeah. you tell your kids to be honest and you sneak them in for the 12 and under price when they're 13. <laughs> <laughs> really? Really? Right. You, you, you put up the fake handicap placard to park in the handicap space and you tell your kids to tell the truth. Be, be who I, you are. Right. <laughs> it's, it, it, it happens all the time and it, There's and it, it happens to everyone, but the less it happens, the more aligned and listen, and these disruptive things back to where we sort of began, we're, we're building a house in the Joshua tree desert here because it's a place I find a lot of solace. I wasn't willing to spend the money and buy the property until my dad died. And my wife, Betsy said to me, cause I didn't really realize I was going to die until my father died seeing his body in that casket and he and I look almost identical looked that was the moment despite as a rabbi standing next to a thousand literally families looking at the body of their loved one it didn't affect me in the same way but when I was looking at my dad's body I was 57 years old and that was the moment when I realized I am going to to die and someday my son is going to be bending over my casket and I'm going to look exactly like that I'm going to die I better live and my wife turned to me she said what are you waiting for what are you waiting for so it these wake up calls are so important and and if you and your listeners can bring them to others in any way, it, it brings great peace and goodness to their lives and to the world. Thanks for being here. Hey, Rabbi, Rabbi. I really appreciate it. Um, what do you want people to check out? Website, book, plug shamelessly. Uh, well, you can follow me on Instagram, which is at Steve underscore leader, L-E-D-E-R. Uh, you can get my books on Amazon and, um, I, I do engage with people on Instagram. If you reach out to me, I'll, I'll reach back for sure. And I really, really deeply appreciate the work you guys are doing. It's beautiful. Hey, thank you for being here. I appreciate all the wisdom you shared with us. Hope to see you again. Anytime. Bye guys. My takeaway was looking at when we were talking about that issue of, around punctuated equilibrium and looking at, at how we advance forward and make change is that there's a real risk that as we go through these transformative periods, that if we're not self-aware, if we're not purposeful, if we're not conscious of what is happening around us, that there's a real risk that that punctuated equilibrium or evolution moves us down to a lower place and that we have to go through these periods of suffering out the other side with something, something that we gain, something that we learned that it makes us better and stronger. My biggest takeaway was the concept of punctuated equilibrium. It's maybe an idea that I was familiar with and it sounded right when he said it. I had never articulated it that way. And when he described there are these events that can either dramatically regress our development or dramatically accelerate our development. It's important to recognize those events, have a learning from those, and accept the suffering that will come as a result, regardless of whether it's a regression or a progression. You just made a great decision to listen to this episode of Decidedly. Make another great decision and leave us a five-star review wherever you listen to podcasts. We appreciate your support. It helps others find our community and defeat bad decision-making in their own lives. For more daily decision-making insights, check us out at decidedlypodcast.com and on Facebook and Instagram at Decidedly Podcast. Thanks again for listening. I'm Sanger Smith, and this is Decidedly. Insights, advice, and comments provided by Sean Smith, Sanger Smith, and speakers identified as part of the Decidedly Podcast should not be considered recommendations. Speakers not identified as members of Decidedly are expressing their opinion, and their statements should not be construed as reflecting the views of the Decidedly team.
This podcast is produced solely for informational purposes, not personalized advice.